welcome Rod Jury. Fantastic. Thank you, Andy. Can I start off by saying to you, Andy, and the Ice House team, it's very impressive to walk around and see the great companies are here. And you guys have been doing this for a while now. There's some real heritage around what you've been doing. And you know, it's really exciting to see um, an organisation that puts so much effort into lifting business up, businesses up to the next level. So I think it's very good. You guys should all be very proud. So uh, lots of exciting stuff going on with us, uh, with Zero and um, uh, things and raising money and our fibre project. And, and uh, unfortunately, Andy's only given me a really short amount of time to, to speak. So why don't we start with questions and... Um, <coughs> And if they run out, then I'll then I'll talk to you. I've got to tell you, I've heard I've heard him do this before. So let's get into Q and A, please. I'm gonna I'm gonna. I can steer you out. I'll stand, I'm just completely comfortable standing here in silence. With with the um, with the SAS model. How important do you think it is for coalitions of SaaS providers to get together to kind of have a, a virtual solution that a, an out-of-the-box thing might have provided 10 years ago? Cool. So, um, as a software as a service, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting thing that's going on at the moment. We're kind of in, in, into a new generation of technology, and when technology changes, there's always a huge amount of opportunity. Because quite often the incumbent players in the market who won the last generation, uh, you know, um, they, the, the sort of uh, history of technology shows it's very hard for them to move. So SaaS is really exciting because it is a whole new generation. So effectively what that means is that computer software is moving away from being installed and on-premise and all the cost that comes with that to, to being able to serve, uh, to be able to be served and sold and supported uh, through the web. So this is really exciting for, for uh, New Zealand software companies because what it means is um, what it means is that the cost of going out to these markets uh, uh, um, that has completely changed. Um, so so we've seen that quite clearly uh, through what I've been doing. The last business we did was a um, email archiving product uh, called Aftermail, and so that was a business where we had to go in and and sort of fly around the world. Uh, we had to sell everyone, um, uh, and, and we got some lumpy revenue up front, but we knew that we couldn't uh, sustain that business for the long term because we just didn't have enough people to fly around the world, and, and it's incredibly expensive. So that type of business, that um, enterprise software business, we drove that business directly to a trade sale. We knew it would be a trade sale right from the start. And the assumption is that once you've done a trade sale for that, uh, you keep doing them, but once we had finished that, the, the objective was actually the, the objective that I had personally was to build um, a long-term business. And the beauty with SaaS, you don't have to sell your business into an existing large multinational that already has a sales channel. You can sort of build that up yourselves. Now the problem with SaaS is that you don't get paid up front. You know, you get paid um, um, in low monthly fees. So it means there's a huge amount. Of, you know, it, 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 it takes some time. And because you're not just building the product, you're building all of the support systems around that, you have to invest quite a lot up front for it to happen. But if you do do that, it's a very exciting space. So it's now to finally answer your question. Um, it's important with these things that, you know, what we're seeing is, a, is ecosystems start to build. And why they're exciting is because the sort of uh, the first player in the market has often built the sales channel, built the partnering channel, building a bit of brand and uh, some credibility. So we've, we've kind of taken um, a leadership role in the um, accounting space, but what we're finding is a bunch of small companies that are sort of building on top of our APIs, and, and that's a great way for them to start. So, so I think it's really important. What it also shows is if um, the ecosystem starts to uh, develop, that's a good indicator that the strategy is working as well. So, so it's absolutely fundamental in a whole lot of different directions. Yeah, sort of speech and a question. It's easy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Rod. Rod. Um, just a question for you. Uh, are the companies, or two questions, are you after startup companies, or the companies that are moving over to you, are they sort of like 5 to 10, 5 to 25 users? Um, what sort of market are you Yeah, um, so, so, so one of the interesting things about doing 
uh, going into the small business spaces, it's really hard to define your market niche because quite a lot of people will tell you focus in on the market. But kind of the tickets to the game in our, in our place is, is actually quite a broad set of features. So we obviously started you know, with, enough, with, with, with a certain set of features that, that we went live on and we um, started to target verticals you know, which, um, uh, who could use those features. But the kind of entry point to the game in our space is actually having a very broad product. So that's, that's been um, uh, quite interesting. And what we found is that small business space is really hard uh, to put in a box. You know, we see very large businesses that are quite simple and very small businesses that can be quite complex. So that's one of the interesting things. And again, that's why it took so much capital, it takes so much capital to sort of build that horizontal platform. Now we've kind of got that kind of critical mass. Certainly the marketing effort uh, that we put in it is much more focused. So we, we sort of stay at the, um, we try to stay at the 19, 19 people and under, mainly because that's the sort of common definition of a SME. But when we look at, um, one of the interesting things about doing this uh, from New Zealand and doing it clean on the web, is you're really trying to uh, build scale into all parts of the business. And that keeps you staying in that small end of the market. So we have a lot of customers with no employees up to 19. When we look at a company are like NetSuite, who has a similar sort of messages to us. You know, they they not, they don't have a fully consistent um, online model, so they're in that kind of horrible quadrant where they have a, sort of an expensive Oracle-style sales model, uh, and they're selling essentially what is low-end ERP, sort of ten thousand uh, dollars per annum plus. So you've got an expensive sales force with a fairly low-value product, um, and so what we've seen now is they're starting to drift up. They're talking about really being a replacement for SAP. So um, it's really interesting how we look at our market forming. We're trying to stay really at the low end because that forces you to drive scale into the business. And I think it's easier doing that from a small country like New Zealand because it's sort of inherently small. Whereas if you're in a larger, um, uh, if you're in a much larger market, it's much easier to go and sell a fewer number of higher value deals. So that kind of DNA keeps us sort of uh, targeting that small market, which we think is the most exciting space. Thank you. We finished it? Oh. Constraints on uh, broadband speed and width, how do you see the portability and wireless interactivity of uh, mobile business being able to uh, consume the kind of visions that you guys are board planning and, and creating right now? Yeah, yeah, so um, the question is, you know, how, how does broadband affect business, really? And what we're seeing is, you know, clearly there is um, a digital divide that's sort of growing between um, here and the States and other markets. Um, and, you know, we haven't kind of noticed that too much, but there's starting to be some signs. For example, we don't have uh, the Kindle here, which for us means that, you know, if you're in the States and somebody tells you, like, here's a good book, you know, the the next time you're passing through an airport and about to jump on a plane, you just grab the book. There's almost no friction. So, so, and if we don't have easy access to that, it means that we're just not getting the same sort of stimulus and information that people, you know, um, in other markets expect. What we also see, if we, you know, we know that it takes sort of two or three years to do these projects. In that time frame, there are some fundamental technology changes. The one that sort of most interests me at the moment is the phenomena of uh, the netbook, and not the marketing term of a netbook, um, you know, which is a small, cheap uh, PC. It's a device that connects straight to the cloud, and all your data is in the cloud. And if you think about what's the most valuable data you have at home, it's probably photos and movies of your kids, and that's not backed up. You know, you might have it on an Apple Airport or something like that. You know, if you're doing well, but we're not even backing that stuff out of our homes. So when these um, new types of devices come out. There is, you know, we don't have enough scale in New Zealand to have those local storage services like YouTube and Flickr and those things, so we're going to just use a whole lot more international bandwidth. And if we don't change the pricing of that, then the implication will be that we won't have access to those devices, and suddenly that digital divide is just, you know, completely splits up. So, you know, that's why we're doing the cable project, it just has to happen. <laughs>